Good evening, our dear guests. Thank you for joining us today in our webinar. I'm Bedr al Ghassim from Arkinet's team. And today's webinar is presented by architect Edward McIntosh uh, by the title, The Impact Artificial Intelligence Art Bots uh, Are Having on the Architecture Profession. Thank you for joining us today, uh, architect Edward. If you may share your screen and the presentation. Hi there, thank you for having me today. Can all hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, so thanks for inviting me uh, today. And um, I'll give you a brief overview of what uh, the talk today is gonna be about. So first I'm gonna give you a quick introduction of how I discovered this um, AI technology, text to image tools. Um, what tools um, mostly has been discussed around in terms of this area of exploration. I'll give you a quick interview of the interface of the tool I use the most called Midjourney. And I'll give you a quick explanation of my personal workflow. At the moment, a lot of people are trying to discover ways to work with these tools. So everyone has a different approach to them. Uh, I'm going to give you, I think, most interestingly, my thoughts on the impact these tools are going to have within the profession, specifically architecture and the design and construction industry. And uh, my thoughts uh, specifically on how I will be using uh, the tools personally in our studio at Atkins and the potential to use it uh, for created endeavors. So uh, let's share the screen. Um, so I will start uh, with a um, small PowerPoint I have over here. Let me minimize this. So can you all see my screen? Yes. Uh, yes, indeed. Yes. So um, the first point uh, would be, um, when did I start um, learning about this AI technology, right? And um, I'm quite active in uh, on Instagram and LinkedIn. And I noticed that uh, certain young architects I was following on Instagram uh, were talking a lot about AI, right? And people talk about artificial intelligence, AI, and machine learning, right? ML. And there's a, a number of people who or a number of companies that actually um, use tools um, to uh, using, using machine learning in order to um, expedite the design process. We have tools, for example, at the office where um, we optimize floor plans, right? So instead of producing ourselves um, uh, 10, 12, uh, 30 iterations of a floor plan, we um, have AI tools that already can um, streamline the process of design right, uh, by us uh, showing some parameters. But on Instagram, I show pictures um, like this from a couple of people I was following. These, um, for those who might recognize it, is a plan view of, or, or are images inspired with uh, uh, on the plan view of Saha Hadid's Beijing um, airport terminal. And apparently what people were doing was uh, feeding an image and letting the AI create iterations of that image, right? So I got curious about it and I started um, looking at the different um, uh, options uh, that were available. Some of them are quite rud rudimentary. So for example, the one you're seeing on the screen right now is called Deep AI. And, and basically it's quite fast, quite easy, but in a way quite limited. Uh, there's another one called um, Hot Pot AI. Uh, there's a famous one as well called uh, Disco Diffusion. Uh, there's DALI2, which is uh, created by, by a company called OpenAI, uh, which uh, Elon Musk is part of. Um, and the key one that I'm going to be speaking on about today, which is called Mid Journey. And I'm going to go online. And, and for those who maybe you are using uh, some of these tools, maybe you're not, but I'll give a quick overview of how to get started uh, with them. Um, I encourage everyone to, uh, you know, we are in the age of the internet. So I encourage everyone to, um, after this lecture, if they're interested, get in one of the platforms. Uh, Mid Journey is quite accessible now. Um, I had to wait, I think I, I, I got in six weeks ago and I had to wait for about a month for the invitation to come through. Now the now it's not done by invitation, now it's open. Um, and one of the things um, I'm going to show you while we're on um, mid journey is a little like, example of how my design process works uh, based on um, 
a task, let's say, my sister gave me yesterday uh, night, uh, and, and I'll show you how um, my particular way of getting to a result is, right? So let, let's jump straight into that. Um, so yesterday, my sister, um, she is a fashion designer in Los Angeles, and she was following this account on Instagram, and she uh, saw these images, uh, which were, um, if you see at the bottom, mentioned that they were created uh, with artificial intelligence. And she wanted uh, to know, um, she's been using Mid Journey, but she wanted to know or asking me, how would you go about creating exactly this, right? Um, part, part of it you, I'm, I'm going to show you is references. So it reminded me of this um, album uh, cover from the Icelandic artist Bjork. So I'm going to show you how to use image references on, on Mid Journey. Uh, and also, I, I one of the things I really wanted to talk about before we jump into the actual um, interface uh, of, of the tool, um, nobody, because it's quite new, nobody that I've read from architects and artists, not from developers, Nobody has clearly explained to me or I haven't found an explanation clearly online about how the, um, the tool works. And I wanted to show this example uh, about shoes because I found it quite interesting. Um, if you see this image uh, in the bottom to the right, there are two shoes, one behind the other in perspective. But if you see, they are both merged into each other. Right. And if you see in more detail, almost all of them do the same. And so I'll try to explain it in, in the easiest way possible. But my this this overlapping of the two images, what it kind of hints to me at is that the the AI doesn't know what's 2D or what's 3D, even though these images look like they are a rendering of a 3D model. I think what the, the way the AI works is that when you write a prompt, uh, an instruction for it to, to create an image, it actually goes online and looks for images that have similar description. But it doesn't know and it doesn't care if they are flat or three-dimensional or anything, right? We, we need to remember that the tools currently that are very popular, Mid Journey and DALI, for example, are basically geared towards or focused on artists, graphic artists. So graphic artists work usually in 2D, even though they might sometimes represent three dimensions and, and depth, usually um, they, they do 2D drawings. So really there is no tool currently in the market, although probably they're gonna appear soon, that it's crafted for architects, right? And so what I think it's, in, for example, when I tell it to do a pair of shoes, it scans all uh, the most relevant uh, shoe images it can find. And when it finds an image of two shoes, it doesn't know that they are in space one behind the other. It actually thinks it's one silhouette. So it's one flat thing and just infills it. But so the way I describe it is that it samples different uh, pixel patterns in the images it looks for on the internet. And then it creates its own pixel collage. And why I think the distinction is important is because some people think that this is an the, the AI creates a 3D model and then it renders it. It it doesn't. This is this doesn't exist in three dimensions. It's always been just a bunch of pixels um, um, collage together. Right. And so that's why it can get such good effect and such level of detail in literally if the server is not busy literally in 30 seconds, right? Whereas if you were to render this, and especially when there's some images I have that you create a forest, very dense forest in the background, that would take ages to um, uh, render if all those leaves in the forest were polygons, right? Um, if, if you ever rendered anything with a lot of polygon faces, you will know that it takes forever. So that's why I believe that the machine doesn't create a 3D object, it actually just comp composes a collage of pixels, right? So let me share quickly um, the the actual example. Um, where are we? Uh, 
over here. Give me one quick second. So I'll tell I'll I'll I'll, I'll show you the example of Mid Journey. So I'll go, I'll explain to you. Let's explain to you first. Um, if you haven't been in Mid Journey, how uh, Mid Journey more, more or less works when you join. So basically, what happens is that you need to go. And apologies, I'm 44 years old, so I had to discover this thing called Discord. I didn't know what this thing was. Apparently, this is where people play Fortnite, which I know it's a game, but I don't. I've never seen it. I don't know what it what it actually is or or how it works. But if you ask me, uh, a very old person, what Discord is, it looks like it's a um, chat room, right, where people interact. Like when I was young, we used to have MSN Messenger, right. So basically, once you get your Discord um, uh, account with your username, you need to find the Mid Journey uh, server, right. Um, and you can you, you can find an invitation. The invitation is something like uh, Discord backslash backslash Midjourney, right? And you'll find the server. Once you are in the server, you'll have this um, interface. You'll have the channels on the left, and you have the users on the right, including very importantly the Midjourney bot, right? And so when I started, um, you start on one of these channels. And they advise you to to find the the channels called newbie because those are the people obviously newbies who have just started. Because I am not a newbie anymore, I think I don't have access. Oh, I have two newbie channels here. I tried a newbie channel the other day, and actually it didn't allow me to do anything because it's, it sent me a message saying uh, I'm not a newbie. So anyway, so if you go to general, for example. I think it's it's very important um, or very useful to start in the shared chats, either general or newbie, because when I started, I, I really don't know what this whole thing was about. Uh, and so you can see the images and then you can see uh, what people wrote in order to create those images, right? So you can start um, learning and correlating things. The other interesting thing is that you can interact with the work others are doing. So for example, um, if you wanted to start, what you would do is, I, I guess this is the most important command, backslash imagine. And once you have that, you can write whatever comes to your mind. So for example, a flying cat, All right? Very short and very simple description. So it's gonna be very loose. So while that waits, other people are typing as well. And the interesting thing is that you can interact with things others are doing. So for example, if you really like this uh, image, you can click yourself to make a variation of it, right? So it'll give you four variations of this theme. You can upscale it to the max, meaning that it will add more detail and a slight change, and you can rate them. Uh, it's really bad, so so uh, good or very good, right? And 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 then they become your thread, and you can analyze them. Okay. So now to talk about um, the the general buttons. So usually what happens is the person wrote backslash and did this description, right? And the first thing you get is four um, uh, four um, different iterations of that description. And so they're numbered in order one, two, three, and four. And so you have the buttons U1, two, three, and four, V1, two, and three, and four. U means upscale. So when you, you'll get one of these, it'll be upscaling more detail like this, right? And once you're there, you can upscale to the max, right? Or you can do, if you wanna bypass the upscaling, you can directly do V, meaning four new versions of one, two, three, and four. Or you can repeat this again using the um, repeat button, right? If you upscale one of these, right, and you get it into a more resolve uh, variation, um, you can then ask for four more variations of it, right? So it's pretty uh, straightforward. Now, now that I I spent I guess a week on on the public channels, after a week. Um, it started being a bit annoying, mostly because um, seems it seems it has calmed down because there's more channels. But when I joined six weeks ago, what happened was that there was so many people um, inputting 
that your the input that you put in that you tapped in uh, tended to get lost. And as a matter of fact, it kind of has happened to me. I typed um, flying cat and I don't see where it is. Oh, here is still waiting, right? So at the moment, um, it's become very slow, to be honest, even for paying customers, it has become very slow. So in terms of, you know, um, the it's very good to be on the shared channels to um, learn a little bit and to uh, even interact with others. But once you um, uh, more or less know what to do, I switched to the private channel just so I could keep track of what I was doing. So same thing inside the private channel. So really here, what you're doing is that you're having a private chat to the bot, so only you and me. Um, now, I've been told that if people uh, look for your um, user, they can find uh, the images you're doing, right? So it's not that this um, makes your images private, right? And that's another interesting topic about this whole process. Um, at the moment, it's quite unclear who holds the IP, the intellectual property. So to use, um, there is a a payment method uh, that um, it's a it's it's a higher payer method in Midjourney that guarantees you privacy uh, from others. But still, there's a gray area on who owns the IP from the point of view of um, the developers of the tool and the and the people prompting the images, such as myself. So. If you remember, I was mentioning, um, I'll take you quickly through a process and I, I wanted to do a process that was non-architectural, right? Because I think it's a bit more interesting since I'm gonna be showing you in the second half of the presentation, more architectural um, uh, input, um, but I'm, I'm gonna show you here. Um, so uh, uh, more or less, what's the process? So what I find really um, interesting, an interesting challenge these days that I've been doing this for six weeks or so, is when I see an image that I don't know how uh, somebody created, right? And to try to mimic that image and try to um, finding prompts. Prompts are, by the way, the things you write here to prompt the artificial intelligence to create an image. So as I was telling you, and let me just remind you for a second, the target of this uh, mission, let's say, I'm gonna show you what my sister was looking at which was this image here, right? So very particular image. Um, so let me go back to the screen. So she was asking me if I knew how that was created. Very particular in terms of looking like real people, but like inflatable uh, mannequins and with exaggerated features and with this kind of glossy finish, right? Um, so I tried to, one of the things I told my sister was that don't tell the, try to not tell the AI what to do. Try to tell the AI what to copy. And so what I'm trying to say there is that it's much better. Imagine you're doing a building, right? If you write to the AI, uh, create to me a modernist building three stories high, so three floors high, the AI wouldn't know what three stories is right? And its interpretation of modernist architecture will be very loose. As a matter of fact, if you type, do me a modernist house, most probably what you're going to come back with is a traditional house with a pitch roof, with a triangular roof, because the word house is very strong and very, uh, even though it's very general, the the classic interpretation for you if they if anyone asks you draw me a house or a, if they ask a three year old draw me a house he's gonna draw a box at least in the west they're gonna draw a box with a triangle on top right so if you want a modernist cube like architecture house is not a good word to put in there right and so what you should do is actually tell it to copy something especially something famous so who then you need to think, for example, and this is part of the process, you need to think who would be the architect that creates, that is famous enough, so there's enough images on the internet, that creates buildings similar to what I want. And so for a modernist building, for a cube-like building, probably is Richard Neutra houses, or probably is Richard Mayer, or somebody along those lines. 
uh, Ricardo Bofield from Spain, probably, although he has his own style. Uh, when I've used Ricardo Bofield, yes, I get um, cube-like um, architecture, but it's always on the pink color because most of the pictures you would find of Ricardo Bofield online are from his project called La Muralla Roja, the red wall, which is actually a pink building, right? And so having that in mind, I started this morning uh, trying to um, approach what my uh, sister had shown me. Uh, and I started with the basics, a highly stylized, stylized supermodel face with narrow eyes and thick lips, which is what I saw on her image. Doug Aitken style, I put it there because uh, I know this is a photographer who does a type of installation work that I thought looked like my sister's image, right? But it didn't give me anything that looked, I mean, it gave me a face, but it didn't give me anything that looked like uh, what my sister wanted. So that was a failed trial, right? Then what I was thinking is actually, you need to think about what you're actually seeing. So did I see on my sister's reference image a human face or a doll face, like a plastic doll? So then I was thinking maybe we start with a doll, right? So like a doll face with sparkle gloss and highly stylized supermodel face, narrow eyes, thick lips, etc. Again, I think it got it a bit more interesting, but not yet uh, what I wanted. I gave it another try, same thing, not what I wanted. Um, I tried it backwards, right? To emphasize the photorealism, I put the photographer first, but still it got stuck in, in, a, in a position that um, I wasn't very happy with. Now, so as I was saying, the best thing is not to tell it what to do, but what to copy. So if, 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 if you think there is an artist that creates a style, either in how it looks graphically, photorealistic or abstract, et cetera, or creates shapes or forms or techniques or distortions that are aligned with what you want, you most probably, if you use them in the prompt, you will get a result that uh, gets closer to what you want. So what I did was in parallel, I researched what artist does um, um, art pieces based on plastic dolls, right? And I found one lady called uh, uh, Olga Kamenetskaya who does them, right? So when I put the prompt, and if you see, I, I on this prompt, I put very little. I just put her and what? Doll face, right? And then I started getting something maybe a little bit closer. I was telling my sister, like an alien face, right? So we got a little bit closer. So once I got here, what I thought was quite um, a, a good direction, I choose one, two, number three, and I upscale it right, to see more detail. So this was the upscale detail, right? And I thought it was more or less close, although it wasn't as kind of um, abstract and, and plastic looking as my sister's um, uh, reference, but it was a good direction in terms of the alien nature of the face, right? And so once I had that uh, direction and I thought it was um, at the right direction so far, I make variations of that, right? So this one was another test with another artist, Nicholas Lam, uh, who also does uh, art based on old dolls. But, you know, it didn't give me, this is more type of classic looking doll. So I, I stopped using that stream, right? But then I jumped from, the, from this one uh, that I, uh, this example that I thought was the right direction, make variations, and they gave me these variations. Now, if you see what happens when you do variations, it starts going again, or let's say exaggerating the commands you already gave it. So the features are more exaggerated, right? So in a way, because that's the direction my sister wanted to go, almost like an alien face, this was the right direction. And then I kept upscaling number two, one, two, and number three, one, two, three, right? And, and you continue with the same process. You get upscales, and if you like them, you do more variations, right? And I tried actually using the actual name of a famous uh, person who was a model. And, and interestingly, it does give you the resemblance of, 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 of actual people if they're famous enough, right? So probably what the bot does is that it goes on the net and looks for pictures of these people. And I don't think it recognizes faces, but it recognizes 
how the pixels are arranged to create the features of these people, right? And so out of those, the one that looked more like the reference images my sister was looking at was U4. So I gave it an up, up, um, upscale. So, and, and as you can see, I'm, I'm, while I'm waiting for one result, I can be testing other things. So the both streams are mixed together, right? But still, I wasn't getting exactly this supernatural look that I was looking for. So what I did then is that I um, started researching uh, on old, um, famous uh, fashion photographers. And I came across uh, this uh, photographer, a photographer called Sean Ellis. So as you can see, he has a very particular um, look, very, very futuristic and cyberpunk, right? So that's something that interests me. So my next prompt where, um, well, specifically for that fashion campaign he did of, so this is the fashion house, plain suit. This is the model that he used for that campaign. And uh, uh, Sean Ellis, the photographer, right? So it's this lady here, right? For this picture, for this campaign in 1999, right? To see what happened. Okay, so it kind of understood uh, the actual model and the style also because um, I started uh, adding things like sparkle gloss, pink background. It gave me this result, but it veered away a little bit. Try other prompts. Now I added huge alien eyes. And now obviously now it became like a properly supernatural feature, which actually it wasn't what I was looking for. So I discarded that. So on the next try, I, I I went into more uh, specificity and I interesting very interestingly I typed exactly what photo shoot from what campaign from what model from what fashion house and what year and probably it went and sampled these images from 1999 right okay so for, with that inspiration and and adding uh, these prompts right it gave me these results now it's interesting to dissect um, what uh, the uh, AI bot understood. So exaggerated plastic doll face covering a layer of transparent glossy sparkle gloss, right? So if you see a couple of them, the plastic is not necessarily on the face, but around. So that's the reason why it gives you options because sometimes it knows that it will misunderstand what you're saying, right? So the plastic that was meant to reference the material of the face, it, ref it, it actually, it was interpreted as a plastic around the face, right? And so I thought these were kind of interesting. It looked like a doll, not a human, and look a bit um, supernatural. So I gave it a couple of upscales, right? And so when you upscale, you get more or less this. I think this had the sparkle, had the exaggerated features, look a bit supernatural. So it was closer to what my sister was asking. Now, the interesting thing is that even if you write yourself the same description, because there's a level of randomness on how the AI um, creates the images, you're never going to get the same images. <clears throat> so I, I was the intention was never to get exactly to where my sister was in terms of her reference images, but sort of find certain prompts that would get you there. And it seems it was relatively a good idea to use the style of this fashion photographer, Sean Ellis, to create these images. And that's where I was trying to tell my sister, don't tell it what to do, tell it more what to copy. That's, that's more straightforward. So after all these trials, uh, we were kind of testing things, right? Just to, you know, and then, then I think one important thing is to keep going. Probably after 10 iterations of make variations and upscale, make variations, upscale, you might reach A, something very close to what you wanted, or B, something very interesting that actually opens the doors to other explorations. Now, another interesting thing that we tried today was to actually upload pictures as references, right? So we were quite interested on this photographer. Um, here, actually, what I did was, as I was uh, showing you on the PowerPoint, there is this Icelandic artist called Björk, and one of her album covers from the 90s 
uh, look a bit like this kind of um, Japanese alien kind of uh, cosplay kind of thing, right? And 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 we mention her here and the name of her al album. But what happened there is she's so strong in terms of being very um, findable on the internet that actually tried to replicate her face. So it moved away from the model lady that we have prompted before, which is very similar looking to this, to uh, Bjork's face, right? So, you know, it's it's interesting how if somebody's more famous or findable on the internet, it will default to that, right? Um, so the next thing we tried was to use an image as a reference, right? And so uh, this is uh, an example of it, right? So I, again, I really wanted to uh, get an input from this famous photographer, um, um, Sean Ellis. So I Googled one of his images, this one, and I, there is, this is one thing you can do in AI. You say to it, uh, you give it the uh, web address of an image and it produces variations based on that image, right? So this whole series that you're gonna see here is ba are based on modifying images. So I'll quickly show you um, how to do that because it's quite interesting. Uh, let's say Saha Hadid uh, building. So what you need to do is you find the image you want now, not all images work. So let's see if this one works, for example. So you go to the origin of the image, right? Um, let's say the Azerbaijan image, yeah. And you do copy link. It, it does depend where the um, image is um, hosted, but let's try it while I show you some other stuff. So imagine, and I'm not gonna tell it to do anything with the image, just interpret the image let's see so while that uh, thinks let me switch to talking about so more or less I, I hope this gives you an overview of what i wanted to contribute to this discussion in terms of how to generate the images meaning i'm not going to talk to you about uh, the syntax or the there are small commands like for example if you go to the general chat you can see that um, people tell it people you can tell it to change the um uh, the ratio so the usually is a square but if you put ar aspect ratio two to three you can change the uh proportions right so that's a direct command let's say uh people are also there are new commands this week uh, about quality sharpness and weight right which but all of this you can you can uh, watch online and 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 there's longer uh, tutorials uh, to learn it from the technical point of view. But what I wanted to to show you was really um, what I wanted to show you was really um, how um, the logic behind um, the the logic behind how to create the images. And I think the one thing I can contribute the most is this idea of tell it what to copy, as I was explaining to you, a photographer, a photo shoot, a famous movie, a famous image, a famous architect like Richard Neutra, right? Rather than telling it, uh, do me a building uh, that looks like a cube, right? Because it might get there, but it's much easier to um, uh, to tell it what to copy. Somebody asked me on LinkedIn this morning, how do you make the, the, the images, like the image uh, you're seeing on the screen right now, how do you make the images look photorealistic? Do you do uh, V-Ray rendering or Unreal Engine uh, rendering or Octane rendering? No, if you if you can do those, of course, and you can do terms like Octane or Redshift rendering, um, Epic Lighting, uh, uh, Sun, Fog, whatever, uh, but it'll always look like a render. You can put hyper-realistic uh, and it look very impactful, but it always looks like a rendering. If you want, and some people want different things, if you want to make it look real, it's very simple. You just you just you just write nature photography, right? Or if you do again, like my sister was doing uh, something related to fashion, you just put fashion photography, and it will do a, a a an imitation of a real picture. I was doing on the series of narratives I'm putting on LinkedIn uh, this week, Polaroid. 
and it just makes it look like a Polaroid picture, like an actual real Polaroid picture. And so that is also to reinforce the idea I was telling you, this thing is not a rendering engine and it's not doing a 3D model and rendering it. This thing is copying something. So if you tell it to copy a render style, it will copy a render style and it look like V-Ray or Redshift or Octane. But if you tell it copy a photograph, right? Like from National Geographic or whatever, it will copy that, right? So on all these in on these vegetation images I'm I'm showing, I'm gonna show you another images. I I used in terms of the render style or the visualization actually, visualization style, I just put uh photography, nature photography. I've seen some people even put photography and the technical um description of the, of the photo photography settings like iso 100 aperture this speed that of the of the shutter etc right so let's jump quickly uh not to extend this too much on what do i think is the use of the tool right so uh talking to other architects around the world the thing we have agreed on is the best use at the moment because it's not designed for architects yet is as internal inspiration for your studio. For example, uh, before we were using Pinterest or any type of board to exchange reference images, right? But sometimes you cannot find a reference image. So for example, if I'm gonna tell my team, let's design in Saudi Arabia a, a, a residential development um, in, let's say in Alula, right? So it's kind of like uh, rocky and, 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 and very natural. Um, and very tied to the earth. Let's let's create a residential development like Venice with canals and water canals in Alula. How would you do that? So in the past, you will have a reference a picture of Alula and a picture of Venice. And you might do a hand sketch or you'll try to collage it, but it will look like a collage or you'll try to model it and rendering it, but that takes a long time, right? And so instead of doing that, you just type it in the computer and it gives you this, right? And, they, and, and, and it gives you a lot of versions of how that could look like uh i think the prompts for this were a navatian uh um a navatian um uh village constructed out of coral rocks with canals like venice right and so it gives you this then uh, i want i personally always wanted to do a project that was a house a modernist house with um alabaster of marble walls where the light can go through and glass bricks tiny glass bricks right so i typed that and it gave me this if i didn't have the tool what i had to do would be to model it and render it right and probably the rendering won't come out as rich as richly textured as as these images right here what i wanted to test always was in the caribbean a a resort that looked like uh, an actual coral reef inside a jungle in Costa Rica, let's say, right? And so to do that, you need to design it, you need to uh, model it, and you need to render it. But if you just put that on the machine, it gives you these ideas, or let's say the flavor, the look and feel, or the Pinterest board that you can be inspired, your team can be inspired, and then start designing. Now, the risk with this is very clear because they look so realistic in a way, and they're so compelling, if you show this to the client, most probably the client will not understand, even if you explain to them that this is just as good as a hand sketch. It's not a 3D model. It's not representing any type of reality in terms of geometry, materials, even sun, right? It's just a hand sketch, but because it, it looks real, they're never gonna understand it. So once you do that, you're gonna run into two problems. A, the client is going to be very scared because it looks very difficult to build because it's very abstract and organic, etc. Or B, he's going to love it and he's going to tell, tell you, I want it exactly like that. And then the problem is yours. You won't have an easy way to build it. Again, anything can be built, but uh, there's degrees of difficulty, right? So if you were to build this, I guess you can do GRC molds or if you have a lot of skilled labor that it's affordable they can chip all this by hand right but you know it's a problem right because the ai doesn't know yet um standard methods of construction so it just does whatever they want on on, on an image base right of course you can do things uh, with a prompt that are more 
or let's say easier to build. Like for example, I always wanted to do a building that I was built entirely out of antique doors. So that's exactly what I typed. A building, a modernist building that is composed of stacked doors of uh, carved in antique wood. And this is what the building gave me. So in order, if I say to a client, I would like to make a building out of doors, probably the client is not gonna understand what on earth I'm talking about. But if I, I show him the image, then at least we have a common ground to discuss about, right? And, but most importantly, I think in terms of sharing with clients is a bit dangerous, but I think definitely there is a place for it to create um, um, an imaginative, creative workflow inside your studio amongst architects. We have also been using uh, the images for backgrounds. So for example, uh, if we want to place a building in a beautiful desert context, in our case, right, uh, we will create a background uh, for the rendering in, in, in AI and place it there. And, and we can tell if, it, if it's day, night, foggy or not. If you wanted to do a house in the Amazon, as I was telling you, uh, all these plans to render all of this would take forever, right? So it's much better to create it here and, and render it and use it as a background. Here, there are some examples of um, a theater we wanted to do, uh, let's say in the center of, uh, um, between Alula and Neom, um, um, uh, we wanted to do a um, concert hall inside uh, one of the wadis, right? And so we wanted to explore ideas of how a concert hall made out of carb rock will look like, right? And so all of these things are in a way unbuildable. And if you think about it, they don't, if you pay attention, they don't even make sense in terms of the composition, but at, late, at least they gave us a good look and feel of different uh, things that we could explore in terms of being a very geological like uh, concert hall, right? Which without the tool, we would only have reference images of a cave from the internet and reference images of a concert hall from the internet and maybe a hand sketch, but nothing as compelling as this, right? Here, we also wanted to see how uh, an installation of this famous artist called James Turrell, who always does this type of atmospheric lighting would look inside a cave, right? Again, this would be difficult to do, or they will take a lot of time to do um, uh, by hand, let's say. Right. So let me jump back. Let's let's check where we are with um, uh, Mid Journey. I think we are on the internet, right? Uh, hmm, I'll be lost in now. Um, Show a windows one second. Okay, I found it. So let's see what it was doing. Do a new share. Give me one second. Oops. Sorry, it's the first time. I use this new system, apologies. Give me one quick second. I just wanted to go back to Mid Journey to see, to show you what it had done on the um, Saha Hadid. Okay, I think I see it now. Let's share screen. Yeah, so you can see we uploaded the image of Sahadid building, right? And it gave us initially these four options, right? And so you can see they they don't represent the building, but they do represent the flavor of the building. So the same type of light, same type of color materiality, and more or less the same geometries, right? And so that's another way to use the tool. Instead of just writing, you can add a link from an image on the web and add a little bit more description uh, to them. So I think with that, um, we're getting close to um, wrapping up. Um, the only other thing I wanted to show you is this is Mid Journey, one of the most popular ones. And this is the other, the biggest competitor to, to it called DALI, uh, DALI 2 by OpenAI. And it works in a similar fashion, but the interesting thing is that it has features that make it work a little bit more 
I would say like um, a little bit more like Photoshop actually. So you can upload an image, right? And you can do a couple of things, make variations or edit the image, right? So make variations is very similar to what we were doing, like the four variations, right? Okay, it seems it's stuck, but basically what would happen um, is you upload an image, right? And you can do two things. You can either edit it, which is great, uh, or make variations. Make variations you've already seen is similar as, as on Mid Journey, but with edit image, it will tell you to select a zone and then you, you can uh, input um, on the command line or, or the prompt line what you would like to do with that zone. Maybe um, make it darker, make it lighter, add flowers to it, et cetera, et cetera. So I think a very interesting workflow moving forward is working with both platforms to use the feature of, of both. Um, OpenAI, Dali makes some really realistic images with simple prompts, but I found that um, the on mid journey you get probably more creative output in terms of the variety of elements um or or alternatives you get into the um into the prompt and so just to wrap it up just to say uh, uh um what i believe the future of of the profession is i don't think the profession is under any threat from from these tools I think it's the same scenario as when parametrics started 15 years ago when I was doing my master's and 3D printing as well. And it's all about us um, getting comfortable with the tool and exploring uh, the things uh, that we can use it for because I believe each of us will use the tools in a different way, right? Maybe some people will use them more to sell to clients because they, they have a way to do it without freaking out the clients too much. I think a lot of us will do it to create reference images. As I was telling you, uh, for example, I needed to do a CGI of a concert hall in an airport. And the concert was meant to be at night in the desert. And so we had in the rendering, we had some LED screens. And so to find a reference image exactly like I wanted of a desert uh, with um, uh, a concert going on was very difficult, right? That's kind of, um, you, you've never seen anything like that. So, but it was very easy to create it in mid journey. I just put exactly that Navatian inspired desert with neon lights and a um, classical concert going on. So I think that um, wraps up um, my contribution to the discussion today and I'll hand over to the organizers if that's okay. Thank you so much for an inspirational uh, discussion, uh, Mr. McIntosh. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. <laughs> That's good. Um, and we're going to move to the uh, Q&A uh, part of the discussion now. Um, mm -hmm. I've received a couple of questions, if, uh, if I may. Please. Sure. Uh, so you... Uh, Mr. McIntosh, you recommend using uh, Mid Journey in terms of using it for conceptualization uh, inspiration. Isn't that is that correct? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think um, Mid. I, I guess the question could be interpreted two ways. Do I prefer the bot service called Mid Journey versus other ones like Dali? Um, at the moment, is the one uh, that is becoming the most popular and the one that I got invited to first, right? So that's the one I've been using. But I highly encourage, as with any tool or software, use and test as many as you can. So try DALI, try MidJourney, and try the new uh, competitors that are going to the market. So that's one interpretation of the question. The other one is, if in general, I advise using AI bots for the design process, I think it's one more tool, a very exciting, very fast new tool that cuts a lot of corners. In a way, it's almost like saying it's a turbocharging Photoshop, right? Because we would do these things in a more mediocre manner in Photoshop, collaging things. This, if you if you learn how to use it, this accelerates that reference image producing uh, process uh, a lot. So yes, you've mentioned you've mentioned. Um that in the prompting of the uh, bot, uh, not to tell it what to uh, do, but rather telling it what to copy. Um, and 
what is your advice uh, of the terms to use? Um, it, let's say if you're if you're looking to create an architectural render and you already have your reference of what you kind of want it to look like in terms of style, aesthetic, um, the nature of the render itself, uh, and then you are stuck in, in 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 the specifics of how it should look like. Um, yeah, we'll, I, yes. Very yes. Yeah. No, I would say again, I will rain rain, rain state. Um, Mid Journey and Dali and all these tools are not for architects. I am sure very soon we will get very soon, like in the next months, if not you know beginning of next year, somebody Autodesk or any or an independent developer, they will come up with an architecturally focused um, tool. At the moment, Dali and Mid Journey are not right. So if, if you already know the look and feel you want, that's great, and and I, and I will repeat that part. If you wanted to look natural like re the most realistic don't put any type of rendering reference just put photo pho photograph right or nature photography right or put a name of a famous photographer because photographers have different styles dark light uh edgy overexposed underexposed right so put the name of that photographer and style so a house on a hill um dog eight can photography style that's it right now that one is easy actually the style to get to create a building how you want it that's very difficult that's maybe maybe some other architects have found a way as i was telling you um the easiest would be to reference an architect that you can copy so again if you want something a bit flowy Saha did maybe if you want something very made out of boxes probably MDRDV from the Netherlands or Ricardo Bofil, right? Or you can tell it things like, do me a tower, like a Jenga tower. I don't know if you guys know Jenga, this, this game where you slide the, the timber blocks, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Or, or you can tell it, do me a tower like a Tetris blocks, right? Or just tell it, do me a tower that is a bunch of cubes stacked on top of each other irregularly right so you need to test what the the thing understands the reality is if you keep doing the return button so do again do again do again the thing understands that the, the bot understands that he is not understanding you so we will try new things new things new things and probably after a while by because it uses a process called brute force which is actually how nature works nature actually is not intelligent. Nature is super dumb. Nature tries everything, right? And everything except one thing fails. And the only reason nature is successful is because nature has unlimited time to test all of the options in the universe, right? And so it fails 99.9% .9 of the time and it's successful only in a small margin. So everything you see in nature, animals, us, etc. Uh, from a, let's say, from an evolutionary philosophy, let's say, right? It's um, it's actually the tiny amount of success stories. And this is the same way these algorithms work. They'll just try everything. Obviously, the more you start understanding the logic of the com of the algorithm, and, and, and actually I've noticed, the more you use the bot, the, because the bot knows who you are, right? It's specific to you. The bot knows the things you like. So the more you use it, the more it knows where to go. It's a good thing and a bad thing. For example, when I started, I started doing actually jewelry. And so I put a lot of gold prompts. And so now, if I don't tell it the color of a thing, it always does yellow. So if I tell it, uh, make me a building in uh, South America, it makes a building in South America and it's yellow. So I need to tell it, don't use yellow, for example, or or I need to specify the color. So, so what I'm trying to tell you is easiest, if you're getting stuck, is give it a reference architect uh, or building that you like. Be careful with terms like house, because you're always going to get this. You're going to get a triangle roof, right? Roof, yeah. Yep. Oh, perfect. So uh, we're going to move into the technical aspect of uh, of using such uh, engines, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, it, so in, in the traditional uh, understanding of using AI, 
uh, or the traditional uh, way orthodox uh, matter in, in, in using it, you would have to have a, uh, a great computing power uh, yes. in order to run those, uh, uh, let's say, uh, ML, machine learning, uh, um, and, and, and as well as allowing the uh, engine to process the information. Um, how uh, do you need such processing power or such computing power in order to use uh, those uh, engines? Yeah, the great thing is that uh, Midjourney and uh, Dali and all this stuff, because they are, uh, I don't know the technical uh, nature of this, they're not running in my computer. So <laughs> the way I work with this is, uh, when I'm at home I, or the office, I use the laptop and while I'm doing emails or renderings or whatever, I type something and I, I, I let it do it, right? So it's on my laptop. If not, I use it on my phone, on an app, on the, on the not the mid-journey app actually, but the Discord app, yeah. right? And so I just type. So really the computing power that you need on your hardware is nothing. It's just an internet connection. Right, because all the computing is done on their server. That's awesome. Um, and then, what is the uh, you mentioned as well uh, the AI intellectual property in reference to uh, the works that are being created? Uh, what are the limitations? Say, if you want to use those iterations in a commercial matter uh, to present them to the clients, maybe using them as part of your uh, delivery scheme and yeah, uh, uh, th that's. That's a great question. And to be honest, um, the nature of the projects in, in Saudi <laughs> and the Middle East is quite confidential, right? And it's very, very, very strict. So unfortunately, I wouldn't be using the uh, material we produce uh, on these platforms uh, for formal work at the moment. So let me let me break it down. So on Mid Journey, uh, there's certain levels, right? Since I work privately on my on chatting directly to the bot, uh, people cannot actively see what I'm doing and what and what my prompts are. Okay, that's fine. But I think if they search, they could. Now, we have another company uh, plan that you pay a bit more and you're totally private. Okay, so so strangers wouldn't see it. That's fine. But we are still not sure and this is a legal matter we're trying to get to the bottom of, if the providers of the service, the owners of the bot, if they have any right to the IP, to an intellectual property, A, and B, if they can see, see it, probably they can, right? Um, so we cannot use it for projects, especially in Kingdom, right? But what we can use it for is to inspire our discussion internally, May meaning our design process in the studio for a project would be for a specific project. We have a room, like a war room that we all share, whoever is working on, on the team during a competition of a project. And we will create the images for us and we will put them as reference images. In the same way, we would do by just Googling, uh, for example, cave. So we want to see caves. And we will Google and get images from the internet of caves, right? And and um, we will use it in the same manner. So it will be public domain anyway. And then our actual design that we produce and that it's under NDA and, and IP ownership by our client is ours and nobody can see it and nobody owns. Well, our client owns it, but nobody apart from our client has a right to it. And in a way, as I was telling you, it's okay because we need that step anyway, because as I've explained, these tools are not yet created for architects. So we actually need to model whatever we or the client likes or we like, we need to model it. And we create plan sections, elevations out of first in, in, in my office, Rhino and Grasshopper, then through Dynamo connected to Revit, right? So that's that's how we do it, right? So at the moment, it's just inspiration images for us. Well, Mr. Edward, I believe this brings us to the end of our uh, session today. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much for an inspirational uh, discussion and uh, definitely an eye-opening experience. Um, 
I would like to thank you again and thank our audience for their attendance. And we will meet you guys in our next webinar. Thanks okay. again. Thank you so much. Thanks yeah. for your attention. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.